You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Challenge us at Wexford Insurances, 0818 31 30 30. My first guest this morning is Kevin Callum, practicing barrister and employment law specialist. Kevin, start by telling me about NERA, the organisation which employers have grown to fear. Well, absolutely. NERA was set up in 2007. It's the National Employment Rights Authority. And what NERA's job is, is to make sure employers in Ireland are up to speed with all of the employment legislation. And trust me, there's an awful lot out there. NERA has many, many powers, statutory powers, to visit employers, to look at their records, to inquire into situations to do with bullying or anything in the workplace. So employers need to be aware of NERA. From one specific point of view, staff seek advice from NERA and other organisations like Citizens Information and Workplace Relations.ie. So NERA is on the radar. They have a number of inspectors. They visit, they inspect, and they can push employers to have to pay out for things that they have not given their staff access to, like the right to you know, uh, leave entitlement or statutory breaks in the working day. So a lot of statutory powers there. What can employers do to protect themselves against an audit? Well, with an audit, an audit is going to happen if it's going to happen. And we have to remember, employers have to work with the inspectors when they call. So what I would always say is employers need to speak to their accountant. Accountant is absolutely crucial. should be the first port of call. Near inspections can be announced or unannounced. They could literally arrive in Dennis Gorthy or any town and carry out inspections up the main street. So what I would always recommend to employers is seek time, speak to your accountant, make sure that you have everything in order and work with the near inspector to make sure everything is done correctly. NERA do work with employers, but employers need to be aware the role of NERA is to check that you're compliant with all of the legislation. And that comes down to loads of issues like organisation of work and time, are they getting breaks within the day? Very important stuff, fundamental, but it can be done and the inspections can be dealt with. From your experience, what triggers an inspection? Well, there are many different types of inspection, and I don't think they're just limited to certain places. You could have a near inspection that just lands into, we say, Enniscorthy, and they get out of the car and they would travel through the town and inspect different businesses. What I would find is that if you go to the website, nearer.ie, you will find there's information for employers and information for employees. There's two different buttons, and to me, that gives the impression that the advice given is on two different fronts. But what I would say is near inspections can be unannounced, they could land into a town, or or an employee, current employee or former employee could make a complaint against the employer and that can trigger an inspection as well. So near inspectors have the power to interview and speak to members of staff. So employers need to be familiar with this. But once again, it's your accountant again who will be very familiar with this um, because they will be giving advice to clients all the time. But what I would always suggest is go to the accountant first and speak to them. Like NERA can enter any business premises at a reasonable time. Now, if that's the hospitality sector, that could be seven, eight o'clock at night. You know, they look for staff who may be under 18, board and lodgings, loads of different things. They can look for pay slips, you know, job title, job description. Does the person have a contract? A very wide remit that they have. But what I would say is work with NERA. Their job is to make sure you're compliant and every employer should be compliant. At the moment, we're working and operating in very difficult and challenging times. And in that case, this was money employers are focusing more on keeping their businesses alive and increasing sales rather than that whole area of compliance. Uh, What advice would you give to businesses that find themselves in that situation? What I would say is you have to make sure your house is in order. The way you do that is around your contract of employment, okay? Now, contracts in the past, employment contracts in particular, from my experience, employers have been too busy running their business. They've been too busy doing things to keep the business afloat, keep people in jobs. Time needs to be spent on contracts of employment because if they are not up to speed and we've had several pieces of legislation that changed in the last 10 years, the redundancies legislation was hadn't been updated since the 60s, updated in the 2000s. We find the same across the board with health and safety, new acts in 2005, 2007. What I would say to employers is this, get your documentation right. It's not just about protecting the employee's rights and entitlements. Of course it's about that, but it's also to protect the business. From my experience, you see situations situations of theft, fraud, um, on the increase in the last few years because of the climate we're in. And the reality is your contract and your staff handbook, they are what give you the power to have policies and procedures like a right to search policy or a CCTV policy. If they're not in there, you don't have those rights to ask the staff to do that. CCTV cannot be used on staff in a disciplinary if it's not in their contract. You can hand it to the guards and you can ask for prosecution. 
but you can't touch them as an employee. So employers and management more particularly, they need to be aware, get it right before you do anything. Because if you do something wrong, that's where the serious trouble arises. Yeah, that's an interesting point. What else needs to be in a contract of employment? Because I think maybe lots of employers over the years have just downloaded a kind of a standard template type contract, which probably isn't sufficient today. Well, absolutely. I, I said it um, on many an occasion. I've seen contracts where you might get to page 20. It looks fine. And then you see this contract is governed by the laws of New Zealand or Papua New Guinea. And you say to the employer, where did you get this? And they'll say, the internet. The reality is these are all old common law contracts. They look OK, but they're not OK. You know, summary dismissal, the right to fire somebody on the spot, dangerous thing to do in this jurisdiction. You must be seen to give people a fair hearing. You must make sure that they have a chance to reply. Fair procedures, very important in our jurisdiction and quite rightly so. But contracts, they're like old lease agreements or tenancy agreements. The day is gone when you can simply ask somebody next door, photocopy me out a copy of yours or like your health and safety statement. Those days are gone. Um, it's a very dangerous step to simply just recycle documents on an annual basis. You need to check you're up to speed. Would I be right by saying that employment legislation here in Ireland is very much weighted against the employer? What I would say is this, and that's a very straightforward question. I'll give you a very straightforward answer. In our jurisdiction, the same as many of these common law countries um, in the past, the employee has their statutory rights, and that's in the legislation. It would be impossible to give legislation to each business. We're all in different lines of work. So what we have is the contract. That's your protection. And if employers can take nothing more from this interview than that, just listen to what I'm saying. Your contract and your staff handbook, they are your protection, your company's protection and your staff's protection. Everybody knows where they stand if that documentation is up to speed. It gives everybody a chance to, number one, raise a grievance or a bullying complaint, and it gives the employer the right to enforce policies or procedures. So as traditionally the Health and Safety Authority, when employers think about that organisation, they're thinking the construction sector, but it's not just the construction sector that should be concerned about them, is it? Oh, not at all. Health and safety is a responsibility for every business in Ireland. There's no doubt about that. It could be a delicatessen, it could be an undertaker's equestrian centre, it doesn't matter. You have, as an employer, obligations on health and safety. And what I always say, and for the purpose of the show, I'd be very clear, if something goes wrong, God forbid something goes wrong, you must be able to show you had an understanding of health and safety, you had a statement, you had a system in place. That has to consider everything. People on the staff who may be pregnant, people on the staff who may have a medical condition, such as diabetes, do you have insulin on site? This is very relevant. And if somebody is injured in the course of their employment and they're out for a certain amount of time, you are statutorily required to inform the authority. And they may very well close your business until they've investigated. So in the past, yes, you're right, Carla, it was construction, it was images of scaffolding or people on the road and lorries and construction traffic. Not anymore. It's across the board. And once again, like the contract, you often go out and you you'll say, show me your health and safety system and your statement. You'll get a huge lever arch file with four inches of dust off the top of it. And the thing is out of date because we had the 2005 Act and 2007. So they have to be up to speed. And people often ask me the question, who does it for you? You need to have a qualified health and safety consultant do that, who carries their own insurance and can stand over what they say. They are your expert witness if something, God forbid, goes wrong. We've mentioned two organisations, two state government-run organisations, NERA and the HSA. Are these organisations uh, there to support employers as well as employees? Across the board, both of those organisations are there to make sure there's compliance. Now, if there is not compliance, it is those two organisations' job to pursue that you know, through a formal process. So I would say both organisations are there to make sure there is compliance. Compliance is good for the staff, it's good for the employer, and on health and safety in particular, you have responsibility for visitors, contractors, you name it, anybody who's on your work experience, students, anybody on your site or your vehicles or anything to do with your employers and employees, you have responsibility towards them. So I wouldn't say is it swayed one way or the other what I will say is both of them are there to check compliance when we look at the employment appeals tribunal we look at types of claims that are taken in employment law unfair dismissal claims which would be the majority of claims the unfortunate thing is there is a burden of proof and that lies on the employer so if you ask me the question to be straight about it that is a difficult position for employers you must disprove what is said against you and that is what the employment appeals tribunal is all about but in the basis of NERA and the HSA, I would say, they're compliance-based, and, and that's only right. 
Welcome back to the show. Employment Law Specialist Kevin Callan is here with me in studio. Before the break, we discussed the measures which employers can take to ensure compliance with employment legislation. I'd now like to address the subject of work-related stress. How much of an issue is it for employers today, Kevin? Well, stress, when I started practising, you know, six, seven years ago, we had issues of stress, but they have developed into work-related stress claims, and they are a huge problem for Irish employers. Uh, Sick days in Ireland are, I think, on average, between four to five million per year is lost, and we have a serious issue with abuse of sick leave. Work-related stress has started to cause a serious problem in the last few years, and that, I think, is a symptom of the way the country is and has been for the last few years. People are under pressure around their salary negotiations, sales targets, deadlines, responsibilities. Businesses are closing and moving 40 miles away and people just can't, simply can't afford to travel to work and are having serious difficulties. I do find in in my own day-to-day work that that does cause a problem, where in the past it wasn't an issue. Now employees and employers do get into situations where it's um, a rock and a hard place and neither can, can move any further. And that is a symptom of the times we're in. Um, but it certainly is clear that it wasn't that way six or seven years ago. It certainly is that way now. And that poses the question then, what can employers do to protect themselves against that? Mm. Quite simply, I would just go back to what I said to you before. The whole issue here is setting down what we call a common language. If you put in a contract and you put in a staff document, such as the staff handbook, policies, procedures, if you do that, everybody knows from day one where they stand. That's very, very important. So somebody knows if their employer is asking them to do something they don't want to do or to change their routine, they have the right to make a complaint and that can be dealt with inside. I find where the problems arise is where the documentation is not there or doesn't exist. And in particular, small to medium sized businesses, they haven't the time to spend on this area. And and that's what causes a problem. Um, if, for example, I work for you and I have a complaint, you've asked me to, to cut 20% off my salary. I'm not happy with it. I don't want to negotiate that out. Well, I know I can put in a grievance. I can complain to somebody else in the company and say, well, look, Carl, it hasn't been fair. Um, I think I deserve to stay where I am at the minute. Well, that's a chance for it to be addressed inside. The whole point is... You want to be able to mediate this inside the company. You want to hold on to the resource. You want to look after the staff member and keep them working. Because the same way you've asked the question, work-related stress, once that person goes out, the company has lost a resource, a valuable resource, who knows your clients, who knows you know where they're at with their work. You lose that, and on a daily and weekly basis, you're going to feel the result. So I always advise the tribunal, any of these places, if you can solve a problem inside the company, do it there. It's cost effective and it's good for your resource, which is your staff member, and it's good overall. Inter- internal mediation is the best solution for all. I'd like to talk to you now a little bit about sick leave. It's a serious problem across the country, both in the public and the private sector. But I want to focus on the private sector for this. Um, what can employers do to protect themselves against the abuse of sick leave within the workplace? Mm, well, sick leave is definitely a problem. There's no doubt about that. I would recommend, in a nutshell, a couple of things that can be done. Number one, a reporting of sickness procedure. The employee must notify their employer the fact that they're going to be out and that has to be done a certain way by telephone communication directly with a superior. On that occasion, they need to give their employer what's called an expected return to work date. So they tell them when they're going to come back. If they fail to hit that date and come back, they're then required to go to the company doctor. Now, we're dealing with sick, a situation of sick leave. You've mentioned abuse of it, but to take it in the round, this is the way to deal with sickness full stop. Whether you think it's abuse or not, this is the way to do it. When they return to work, they should be required to carry out a return to work form. And that's very important because they give you the reason they were out. They give you a signed document to say they're fit to return or they have a doctor cert. That protects the company and everybody in health and safety. And they give the employer permission to check it out. And if it's found not to be true, that links into your disciplinary process. So that's very important. And I think that is the way to tackle sickness in the workplace and abuse of it. Yeah, very good idea. Um, What about for those, let's say, that are out on long-term sick leave? Well, long-term sick leave, believe it or not, occurs where people don't have a reporting of sickness procedure or a return to work process because the employee is out and the employer cannot ask them back and cannot get them to visit with the company doctor. So what I would say is if you're in that situation, you're in that situation. But if you don't have that problem at the minute, it is the ideal time to introduce this because if your company or business hasn't suffered from this to date, that is not to say it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. Okay, not to be carpering on on the negative side, but bullying... That's something, again, that's a serious problem in Irish workplaces. What can the employer do to protect themselves 
in the event of that happening within their workplace? Yeah, once again, Carl, just on the small to medium sized business, let's say a manager has a problem with a director. What do you do? Who do they make a complaint to? That's where you put in place that a third party can come in to hear it. And as you said yourself, in-house mediation, that's the way to deal with it. So what I would suggest is any company, no matter how small, you have what's called a grievance procedure. And if anybody's listening to the show, open the contract, have a look at it, see what's there. So it has to say that if somebody has a complaint of bullying, we get them on bullying, intimidation, harassment, isolation in the workplace, they need to be investigated inside and they easily can be. But it's important for managers who have a problem with a director that they have the opportunity to complain to a third party so they're not restricted in any way. And that effectively cultivates a good culture in the company. Everybody's happy, they're looked after, their rights are there. And it's the way to do it. But they are important, and I'm glad you asked the question, they are important at the minute because bullying can come in in cases to do with salaries, you know, any kind of uh, job uh, description change, any tasks or anything like that, they can all encompass into it, as can possible redundancies or retirement situations. And in the event that, let's say, there is a bullying issue within the workplace, you mentioned that an internal investigation can be carried out. What's the process? Well, what we usually find is, let's say, once again, to use the example, I work for you, I make a complaint that somebody has bullied me in the workplace. Now, I put in a grievance complaint, and that should be in my staff documentation. Now, you as the employer will hear that, and you will say, right, Kevin, we've looked into it, um, and we're satisfied that there is, a, there is an issue here. Your next step is to discipline that person. So you would once again go to the company's disciplinary procedure, and you will discipline the person who has been responsible for that. If you find my complaint is not accurate, you can take it no further than that. You know, you don't have to do the investigation. What I always say to employers, a very important point, this comes up a lot. Somebody witnesses somebody being bullied and the employer is saying, well, what do I do? If, for example, I witness somebody being bullied in your company and I say it to you, your first part of call is to go to that person and say, have you been bullied? But if that person is not in a position to pursue it or doesn't want to pursue it, you can't pursue it. And some employers, in, in the interest of their staff, try to pursue it. But you cannot deal with somebody accused of bullying if the victim is not willing to come forward. You have to be very clear on that. Kevin, one final question for you. If you had to give advice to employers out there today in relation to checking one thing in a contract to make sure they're in compliance, what would that be? Well, Carl, the one thing I would always suggest is that employers look at the force majeure procedure. Force majeure is a statutory entitlement to emergency leave, right? And people have three-day entitlement in one year. So in the last few years, we've seen this abused, um, where employees weren't sure what it was and managers didn't have a clue what it was when they were contacted. We got it with the ash cloud and we got it with the snow in 2010. Force majeure is family or dependent related. So basically, somebody works for you nine to five. If they get a call at four o'clock in the evening and they have to go, Uh, to an emergency a child has broken its arm or you know a dependent has an emergency they have to go if they take that time that counts as one full day and some people think you can get a second day in a row no if it pushes into the second day so if the person's child is still in hospital needs to get its an x-ray on its arm or something like that that counts as a day's leave or an unpaid day but it's not force majeure but this is confused by staff and management so if people want to check if their document's up to speed or if it's sufficient i often say use that as the barometer go to force majeure see what it says if it simply says emergency leave three days your document's not up to spec if it says family or dependent related emergency only and so on that gives an indication the document is is familiar with what's required in the last four or five years in irish law you're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Think Wexford Insurances for your business insurance.